Do not venture too far from the safety of our village, for deep in the wilds of unknown lands and avoided by all experienced hunters and travelers at the foothills of the Forbidden Mountains, there is a cave littered with the bones of her victims. This is where you will find the lair of the hag. In this video, we'll be exploring the history and lore of the hag. As subscribers to We Love TTRPGs already know, this series of videos is all part of our exploration of all things witchy, from the Baba Yaga of Slavic folklore, to the wisdom of the witches, the demonic succubi, the demon lord Grozit, and finally, Igwilv herself. If this is your first time here, be sure you've subscribed and hit that notification bell so you don't miss these exciting videos. In terms of game mechanics, a hag is a category of monster, like giants, dragons, golems, and demons, while a witch is a profession or character class title. Therefore, to better understand what exactly a hag is, I have broken this down into three distinct categories. The first is the derogatory label used to slander and demean strong independent women. This is where people often mistakenly confuse witches for hags. Watch my video about witches to fully understand this association. In a nutshell, hag is essentially just a misogynist medieval label for women who wouldn't act the way a male-dominated society, particularly during the rise of Christianity, expected them. These labels were often used as a tool of social control way to punish and marginalize those who did not fit into the established order. It's in this respect that fantasy games get the label of hags so wrong. By the end of this video, we will learn to correct this. Then we have the hags from myth and legend. Found around the globe, these were often supernatural and their stories were typically used to frighten misbehaving children or to teach some other moral lesson. These hags also served as a type of boogeyman. In this category, we include fairies that appear as old crones and goddesses or other creations from a culture's mythology. These are often purely fictional creatures and many of the existing role-playing game hags originated from this category. This also includes hags from fairy tales such as Grimm's and those that have appeared in cartoons or depicted in Disney movies or TV shows. Witch Hazel from Looney Tunes, the gingerbread hag from Hansel and Gretel, or the sea hag Ursula from The Little Mermaid. One of the most well-known of these is the Baba Yaga, which I have already covered in a previous video. In this category, you would also find the Gaelic Kaliak, the Greek Morai, or Jenny Greenteeth, a type of sea hag, and the Black Anis, both of which originate from English folklore. There is also the Sukunya, a shape-shifting, blood-sucking hag from Caribbean folklore. There are just so many more examples found all around the globe, but Regardless of their point of origin, they generally serve the same purpose with very similar traits. I would also place the night hag in this category, though it is a bit outside of the others and its origins, since in our real world, night hags, just as succubi, originate from sleep paralysis hallucinations, a perfectly explainable sleep disorder that had not been understood by ancient cultures. In China, for example, these events translate to pressure demons, I will cover all of these creatures in this category along with our role-playing game counterparts in separate videos. In our third and final category are the role-playing game hags. If not entirely fabricated from whole cloth, these are usually influenced by one of the previous two examples, taken from myth and legends, then beefed up and expanded upon for our fantasy heroes. To make these monsters more interesting, we should try to understand a little of the myths that they were based on. And by the end of this video, I'll give some Game Master tips to help you do just that. Real world lore. The word itself has a long and complicated etymology, which I considered discussing until I realized I couldn't pronounce half the words. So if that interests you, I'll have some links in this video's description. The concept of the hag dates back far into ancient human civilization and often served important roles in a culture's stories to pass on wisdom and warnings of dangers from forbidden places and uncharted lands. In European folklore, they were defined as ugly and wicked old women who practiced witchcraft with powers typically thought to have been granted by supernatural means. These hags were feared and thought to be evil. My video on witches covered this in great detail. I'll have a link at the end of this video, so be sure to stick around. In many of the old Irish folk tales, the hag represents the barren land, where it becomes the hero's responsibility to approach her without fear, and then come to love her. When the hero displays courage to accept and embrace her, even her hideous side, 
The hag reveals its true form as a young and beautiful goddess. I made the intentional decision to not include mention of hags in my witches video because, well, we live in the 21st century and it's, it's time to stop repeating misogynist rhetoric from the 13th century. That's not to say a witch couldn't be a hag or a, a hag a witch, but those two labels shouldn't be considered equal in definition. In the Middle Ages, a woman with no husband might be viewed with great suspicion, particularly if she challenged the authority of the church, which might have been as simple as offering healing through herbalist remedies. Instead of relying on prayers from the local priest, some pagan heretic was using witchcraft to heal the sick. You can only imagine how this would have been frowned on and considered a threat to the established order. Game lore. Now let's take a look at some past game lore and how we might combine all of this information to use in our fantasy role-playing games. Keep in mind that because this is a broad monster category, we're looking at nearly five decades of published material, and I'm not gonna be able to cover every single entry, just the most important ones. The Dungeon Dragons Hag, a sea hag to be exact, first appeared in original D&D's Blackmore Supplement 2 by D&D co-creator Dave Arneson. Here, all it said was sea hag, same powers as Dryad, but attempts to kill victims with her ugliness. Looking at original D&D's book two, Monsters and Treasure, we find the Dryad entry that informs us they are beautiful tree spirits, and they will stay within 240 feet of their respective tree. It says they have a powerful charm person spell with a 10% chance of succeeding. Lastly, it tells us Dryads have exact knowledge of the woods around them. From this, we might assume that in original D&D, sea hags were ugly sea spirits with exact knowledge of the ocean around them. Also, this assumes they were so ugly that by simply looking at one, there was a 10% chance you would die. Also from this, we can see hags have been considered fey since the very beginning of D&D. Then in 1977's first edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Monster Manual, we get our first full entry for the Night Hag. In 1983's Monster Manual 2 for first edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, we are given the Anis and Green Hags. In 2nd edition AD&D's Monsters Compendium Volume 2, they were put together as a specific monster type with Anis, Green, and Sea Hags. And this is where the background and lore for these monsters really began to get detailed. Here we are told of their ugly appearance, foul dispositions, and powerful magic. We are informed that hags live alone or in coveys of three and always choose desolate, out-of-the-way places in which to dwell. We are told covens may include a mix of hags, and it is not necessary for them to all be of the same type. Additionally, despite a preference for solitary life, they sometimes coexist with ogres or evil giants. The ogres serve as guards and servants, while evil giants are treated as equals, and they work together to accomplish evil deeds. This entry also tells us the hags have a ravenous appetite and may devour a medium-sized creature in just 10 minutes. They prefer human flesh, but will settle for goblinoid or demi-human if necessary. And the hags' evil reputation has earned them powerful enemies, besides humanity in general, including good giants and dragons. Despite this, hags reproduce quickly by transforming into beautiful maidens to mate with men and their offspring are always female. Reappearing later in 3rd edition D&D, again grouped together as in 2nd edition, with the Anis, Green, and Sea Hags, it says coveys are typically formed by one of each type, and all hags speak common and the language of giants. Other than game mechanics and slight flavor text, no real changes were made from the previous edition. In that game, we are supposed to call a 4th edition, it says that hags often know dark rituals that allow them to scry distant places see into the future, manipulate the weather, or place curses on those who anger them. Additionally, it tells us that hags are living manifestations of nature's ugliness. It says they are miserable and conniving, seeking to destroy those who are content in life. They like to collect treasures and will often impart knowledge or free captives in exchange for valuable items. And a big departure from previous hag entries, because of course, we are given the howling hag Bog Hag, Night Hag, and Death Hag. This listing for hags tells us they are wise in the ways of dark magic, curses, and they sometimes choose to serve more powerful evil beings as advisors and soothsayers. It says most hags are petty tyrants who prefer to bully weaker monsters 
and foment wicked schemes against mortals unfortunate enough to live close by. I'm sure there were other types of hags appearing in other books for that game, but honestly, I, I just don't care. Which brings us to actual Dungeons & Dragons. In 5th edition's Abolo's Guide to Monsters, this is where we are given a tremendously useful amount of hag lore for our games, which I consider the definitive final say in all things hag for your 5th edition D&D game. Honestly, reading it just blew me away. It reminded me so much of the best ecology of articles from Dragon Magazine in the 80s and 90s, back when D&D authors knew what they were talking about. Because Volos is no longer in print, yet so incredibly useful, I had wanted to just read the entire thing. Perhaps I will in a later video, but that's just too much added information with everything I'm already covering in this video. Therefore, I'll try to narrow it down to some of the most important facts. Bolo's Guide covers the hag's wicked mannerisms, filthy appearance, cruel temperament, tricky one-sided bargaining, details about the special hag magic, their odd modes of transportation, like the Baba Yaga flying around in a giant mortar or cauldron, hag society, if you can call it that, their covens and hag layers. The section on layers is particularly useful, suggesting layer actions and regional effects for the most powerful hags, called grandmothers or aunties. It talks about tips for role-playing hags, along with how to use them in combat. I'll get into all of those details when I upload videos about each specific hag type. In Bolo's Bestiary, we are given a short entry with hag stats telling us that hags delight in bringing ruin and misery to the world. Malevolence is such a core part of a hag that it shapes her physical form and molds her magical powers. Again grouped together, this time featuring the Anis Hag and the Burr Hag, or Winter Hag. Then in March of 2015, Keith Amon added to his Monsters Know What They're Doing essays with Hags Revisited, parts one and two. I'll include links in this video's description. Keith's articles were composed with the use of lore presented in Bolo's Guide. In the Monster Manual 5th edition, it gives us the same information we previously heard from earlier editions. Hags are evil, cruel, ugly, and so on. It says they are ancient beings with their origins in the Feywild. This entry says hag names are darkly whimsical, with examples such as Peggy Pigknuckle, Grandmother Twitch Willow, Rotten Ethel, or Anti Wormtooth. In earlier editions, we were told hags reproduced by turning into beautiful maidens to mate with human men. Now in 5th edition, a little bit off-brand here, we are given a much darker explanation, stating hags devour human infants, and a week later, give birth to a daughter who looks human until her 13th birthday, when the child transforms into the spitting image of her hag mother. Hags are arrogant to a fault, believing themselves to be the most cunning of creatures, and they treat all others as inferior. Even so, a hag is open to dealing with mortals, as long as those mortals show the proper respect and deference. Over their long lives, hags accumulate much knowledge of local lore, dark creatures, and magic, which they are pleased to sell. Hags enjoy watching mortals bring about their own downfall, and a bargain with a hag is always dangerous. The terms of such bargains typically involve demands to compromise principles or give up something dear, especially if the thing lost diminishes or negates the knowledge gained through the bargain. It says hags love the macabre and festoon their garb with dead things. They accentuate their appearance with bones, bits of flesh, and filth. They nurture blemishes and picket wounds. Attractive creatures evoke disgust in a hag, which might help such creatures by disfiguring or transforming them. This embrace of the disturbing and unpleasant extends to all aspects of a hag's life. A hag might fly in a magical giant's skull, landing it on a tree shaped to resemble an enormous headless body. Another might travel with a menagerie of monsters and slaves kept in cages, and disguised by illusions to lure unwary creatures close by. Hags sharpen their teeth on millstones and spin cloth from the intestines of their victims, reacting with glee to the horror their actions invoke. Accentuating the difficulty of even reaching the layer of a hag, it says that hags dwell in dark and twisted woods, bleak moors, storm-lashed seacoasts, and gloomy swamps. In time, the landscape around a hag's lair reflects the creature's noxiousness, such that the land itself can attack and kill trespassers. Trees twisted by darkness attack passers-by, 
while binds snake through the undergrowth to snare and drag off creatures one at a time. Foul, stinking bogs turn the air to poison and conceal pools of quicksand and sinkholes that consume unwary wanderers. Then we are given stat blocks for the green hag, night hag, and sea hag. And why use just one hag when you could use three? Before talking about covens in game terms, I'd like to remind you that the entire concept of covens was most likely fabricated during the moral panic of the European witch hunts. If one witch was scary, then wouldn't a group of them be even worse? As explained in my witches video, there's just no historical evidence in any reliable literature supporting the existence of covens in the ancient world. In a twist of defiance and irony, modern witchcraft does embrace this idea though, as does our fantasy role-playing games. The powers of a coven are believed to be greater than the sum of its parts. When witches work together in a covey, they combine their energies to cast more powerful spells and perform more complex rituals. The covey also provides a space for collective worship and celebration, enhancing the spiritual experiences of its members. In some traditions, the covey is also believed to provide protection for its members, both in a physical and a spiritual sense. The coven acts as a kind of spiritual family, supporting and defending its members. Though covens never existed in the ancient world, they do provide a good challenge in our fantasy role-playing games. Beginning with the Hag entry from 2nd edition AD&D's Monsters Compendium 2, we are told Hag Covens are formed by three Hags of any type, and the Coven then has special powers that individual Hags do not. There's also a list of spells and how they are used given for that edition. We are also told these spells are never cast in combat, but are instead used to weave wicked plots against neighboring human or demi-human settlements. We are informed a covey of hags is 80% likely to be guarded by a mixture of 1d8 ogres and 1d4 evil giants. Additionally, a coven may polymorph one or two ogres into less threatening forms to send into the world to use as spies. These spies would typically be in possession of a hag's eye, a magical object worn by one of the spies. The eye appears to simply be a minor gem of low value, but is actually a real eye that had been plucked from a past victim. Destroying a hag's eye inflicts 1d10 points of damage to each hag in the coven, and one of them is stricken blind for the next 24 hours. The hag's eye is repeated in subsequent editions and is included with 5th edition as well. For 5th edition, coveys are discussed in the Monster Manual, but are even better described in Bolo's Guide. Now remember, this video serves only to cover hags as a group, within the length of a standard YouTube video. This means I've tried to give you a broad overview, but I will be covering all of the individual hag types in greater detail with future uploads. This will include real details on coven powers, layer actions, role-playing tips, and other important details. Now, let's look at some dungeon master advice. Experienced dungeon masters know the importance of subverting expectations. We strive to craft creative challenges our players will remember long after they had finished the adventure. Start by subverting the evil witch stereotype. Introduce hags who, despite their intimidating appearance, are not necessarily malicious. They might offer quests or aid to the players, only revealing their true nature later in the story. You could introduce your evil hag early in a campaign as a kind and beautiful forest maiden with her entourage of forest creatures. Of course, this hag and her ogre guards will eventually become a big problem for the players. And if you're actually using a hag from a role-playing game's bestiary, don't use the word hag. If you do that, all your players immediately metagame the whole thing and it ruins the mystery. However, if you aren't using a hag, but have a creature mistaken for a hag, then by all means, call it a hag. Your players will be metagaming their way through it only to discover you've caught them by surprise. To really get the most out of hag encounters, we should be thinking about schemes and entry. Try creating hags with complex moral alignments. Some may have sinister intentions, but can also be motivated by a desire to protect their homes or families, adding depth to their characters. Your hags should have distinct motivations. Perhaps she is seeking redemption for past actions or injustices committed against her or her coven sisters. This could highlight the historical theme of societal mistreatment, as I mentioned at the start of this video. Is she actually evil, or is that just the label given to her by the townsfolk? Is she really even a hag at all? And after decades of mistreatment by the so-called good villagers, the hag has begun to defend herself. How do players react upon learning they've actually been hired to kill an innocent old woman? 
Who's the actual bad people in that scenario? In fact, you could craft a hag encounter that challenges the player's morals rather than combat skill. Watch my videos about alignment for guidance in this matter. For such an encounter, players may have to decide whether to assist a seemingly evil hag or side with the villagers who fear her. What if an evil priest secretly living in a village had kidnapped and cursed a beautiful maiden in retaliation for the king banishing him from the kingdom. And now this polymorph princess must live out her days as a hag. Does she even realize her true nature? Just as I described the true lore of the Baba Yaga, you should seek to create hags with unique and valuable knowledge, mundane or magical. Instead of being adversaries, they can become mentors or allies who teach players unusual spells or abilities in exchange for assistance at a price, of course. Or what happens if the players learn the villagers are wrong about the hag, seeing her true self, but now must face the wrath of those who fear her? With the removal of Detect Evil spells in 5th edition, not something I approve of, by the way, this becomes far more complicated of a scenario. What if one of the players or a loved one is dying? Perhaps an entire village has become ill, and the only way to save them is by seeking help from the crazy old lady in the woods. This hag is immortal and has great wisdom, enough to know to help these adventurers who will grow in power until one day she may use them to achieve her evil goals. If we are to make hags more than just a stat block you overcome with dice rolls, then we must humanize them with personal stories, vulnerabilities, and emotions. Show that they can experience love, loss, and regret challenging the notion of hags as one-dimensional villains. As Game Master, you could use hags as they were intended in our ancient myths to teach moral lessons, and through such encounters, your players can explore themes of empathy and tolerance. In this case, players might even learn valuable life lessons about discrimination and persecution. Here's an example I used back in the 90s. My players had to acquire a very powerful and unique magic item that was in the possession of a hag lich named Galenda who made her home in the frozen Arctic wastelands of the north, where no humans could live. If the players had tried to murder their way through, she would have easily crushed them. A lesson they learned early on. Looking for allies and uncovering information to use in her defeat, the players learned the legend of Galenda. She had once been a good and kind queen, whose heart had grown so cold her entire kingdom froze over. In fact, long, long ago, humans had lived in her kingdom and there were many small settlements along the coast and on flowing rivers, now all turned to great sheets of ice. The players learned the only way to defeat this hag lich was to find the key to her heart, which was a fey nickname for an enchanted hand mirror of artifact level power. This mirror had belonged to Glenda in her youth. The key to her heart was now long lost in a wilderness cave guarded by a supernatural beast of shadow, a type of living curse. Though still a formidable opponent, the players might actually be able to defeat the Shadow Beast. Then, in possession of the Hand Mirror, they would need to confront the Hag Lich. It was only by forcing Galenda to see her reflection could she realize what she had become. This would melt her frozen heart and transform her back into the good creature she had once been. I still have so many fond memories of that infight. The players had to get in close enough to use the mirror, all while she was blasting them with spells and a horrible chill aura. They barely succeeded, but they did finally win the day using their wits. After three successful uses, the hand mirror transformed the hag lich into Galenda, the good lich of the north. And now to this day, a good arch lich lives in the farthest north of my campaign world. So in the end, do not think of your hags in mere mortal terms. They are extensions of nature. They are divine retribution. They are creators and destroyers of life. They are goddesses and represent duality. Their wicked reputation is linked with humanity's fear of nature's destructive powers, with the fear of the unknown and a feeling of helplessness against a seemingly cruel and unfair world. Well, I have a lot of work to do. I need to finish my videos about the demon Lord Grozit and finally the lore of Big Will. I'm very excited about these and I appreciate your support by liking this video and tell me in the comments your thoughts about hags. Has this video been helpful to you? I sure hope so. As always, I'm your host Atten here at We Love TTRPGs and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.